I invite you to sit back in your seat, lay the things that you're holding in your hands on the seat beside you or put them in the pew rack. And if you feel safe to do so, you may close your eyes. And I invite you this morning to take in a deep, deep breath. Clear down into your belly and breathe out through your mouth. Let your shoulders relax. Let your body relax. Breathing in again, breathe in the breath of life from the Holy Spirit. And as you breathe out, let go of worries and troubles and conflicts that you are carrying. Give them over to Jesus to carry for you. Breathing in again, that breath of life again, and letting, breathing out, letting go of the things that you've got weighing on your mind, the things that need to be done, the things to do, deadlines coming up, the busyness of life, anything that will distract you from spending this precious time with our Savior. Continue breathing and contemplating as we listen to our prelude this morning. You will notice this morning that the words for the forgiveness and uh, confession and forgiveness have changed a bit. And so there is a reason for that, which we'll look at later this morning. Okay. So I invite you to stand as you are comfortable. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, 
Jesus who bears the cross, the Spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others, for the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us, for the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Our gathering hymn is number 847. Come, let us join our cheerful songs.
Let us pray. O oh Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from the 50th chapter of the book of Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The second reading is from the 14th chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. That all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord. Since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as mm, seven times? And Jesus said to him, Not seven times but I tell you 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all of his possessions and payments to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, oh, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. 
Should you not have had mercy for your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I would like to invite our young person to come forward. Oh, we have Nora too, huh, Nora? Okay, good, I have two young persons, besides myself, of course. Hey, buddy. Hey, come on, have a seat. You want to sit right here? You want to sit with your grandma? Okay. What's your name? What's your name? Theo. Oh, I love that name. Did you know that your name Theo means God in Greek? That's pretty cool. <laughs> well, today, in our prayers a little later, we're going to remember someone named um, Hildegard of Bingen. Now, Hildegard lived between 1098, and she died in 1179, so that's been quite a long time ago, right? She was a nun, and um, later an abbess, like in charge of, um, of other nuns in Western Germany. And she was considered to be a mystic. Mystics were and are people who see God in ways that the rest of us might not. And a lot of the mystics who lived in that time around um, Hildegard created and saw visions of God and shared them so that much of our liturgy today, like what we say during church and how we believe things, is influenced by their visions and the things that they heard God saying to them in their lives. And I have a picture of Hildegard because, you know, they didn't have photographs then, but somebody wrote an icon about her. And so I found this online. So this is, this is an icon of Hildegard. Okay, I know you guys can't see it back there, but I'll, I'll put it back on the bulletin board. Um, she, um, she was a woman who was before her time. So like today, we hear a lot about climate control and cleaning up the creation, right? Do you think that's something new? That in the last few years since, you know, we've been having all this crazy weather that people are all of a sudden started thinking about, oh my goodness, we're destroying the planet, we've got to do something. You're right, Nora, because back in Hildegard's time, in the 1100s, um, she was very much concerned about creation and worried that we weren't taking care of it and weren't honoring it and respecting it the way God intended for us to do. And so um, she also um, not only was a, one of our first um, conservationists and environmental scientists, she was also a healer. She um, used all kinds of herbs to, to create medicines and things to heal people. She um, was a writer and an author, and she wrote um, songs. In fact, in our um, ELW, hymn number 399, the melody was not Hildegard's, although she did write melodies, a lot of our chants, and when we intone things in church, some of them could be from her. But the words are from some of Hildegard's writing. She was an artist, too, and her art was inspired by her visions, and I'm going to share one with you right now. So this one, and I know you all can't see it, we'll put it on the bulletin board, but this one is, um, have you ever heard of a mandala? Okay, it's, it's a, a meditation tool, and, um, and so some of, her, some of her drawings are patterns, so I think it was mandalas, but this is um, a create, a, called the creation egg. And I, again, I know you can't see it, but it's shaped like an egg. And there are all sorts of things. There's stars in here. 
there's the sun and the moon, and everything in this depicts some aspect of God's creation. And Hildegard looked at creation and this egg as um, a, a representation of the feminine side of God's love and nurturing of creation and, and of all of us, um, like a womb. And so she had some very interesting things to say, and um, I wanted you to know a little bit about Hildegard and encourage you um, to make some time to Google her. Um, there are lots of books that Hildegard wrote um, that are very interesting and very spiritual in nature. And so today when we, when we pray and give thanks for the saints who have gone before us um, and their influence on us and our lives today, Hildegard is a person we're going to remember today. So I, I made a blank one of the creation egg for you to color. And here you go. And Theo, I've got one for you. And I have um, colored pencils, so wait a minute, let me do something. These are my used ones. But this is a new pack. And here's a new pack. I didn't have three new ones, but oh, yeah. There you go, buddy. You can color that. All right. So let us, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for all the people that you send into the world who help us to see you in new ways. To see you as a loving, creating, forgiving, generous Father of all and Creator. Help us to see other people the way you see us. And be with us as we go through our week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thanks for coming up, you guys. Phew, for a minute there, I thought I forgot my sermon. Okay, here we go. Today our, our scripture themes focus around forgiveness. And one of the things that occurred to me, and that I've heard folks say, and I'm going to say folks in general terms, that doesn't mean anybody here, it could be at any point in my life, um, say that sometimes in our Lutheran liturgy, where we often pray the same things week after week, if at some point do we come to a place where we're not really thinking about what we're saying or praying. And so I decided that because today's theme is about forgiveness, I wanted our confession to be different so that as you read those words, they could sink into your hearts and give you a different way to look at what we, what we confess and how our, our sins are sometimes things that we wouldn't categorize them to be. I remember when I was like a teenager, just finishing up confirmation and all those good things, I felt really holy and enthusiastic. I remember kneeling for the, the confession and thinking to myself, well, this doesn't have anything to do with me. I, I didn't do any of these things. But, you know, I still said the words with everyone else, and I was still forgiven, just like everyone else. But as I matured in my faith, I learned that, oh, yes, you did do those things. You may not have overtly done them, intentionally done them, but sometimes we sin in ways that we don't even realize we sin. That's why in our, our confession today, if we, we prayed, um, my glasses here, for the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. We, we, we buy products 
or we support organizations that, that we find out later have unfair labor practices, who have done things that are harmful to our planet. Are we to treat people unfairly? No. Are we to harm the planet? No. And so when we support those businesses or organizations or um, and, we, and we, we, we don't know that those things are happening, we, we sin, we don't even know it. Which is a really weird thing to think about, isn't it? Kind of scary in a way. However, my dear friends, we have hope. Because in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven for our sins, both known and unknown. So in the coming weeks, as we, we confess our sins, I'm going to kind of slow down the pace a little bit. So that as we pray each of those lines in, those con in the confession, that we can take a moment just to think about that. Now, as I said, we are talking about, about forgiveness. And I know that I take lots of time to consider my life, both currently, in the recent past, and long ago, and think about all of the times when I have been asked to forgive someone for something. And how I might have handled that forgiveness. Did I forgive fully and completely? Or not? What happened? I would imagine that all of you too have thought about your own life and forgiveness. We all do. In our worship, do you realize how much of our worship is patterned and focused around asking God's forgiveness. For example, we um, stood before God today just as that slave did in the parable that Jesus told. And we begged, pleaded, maybe, asked God to hear our confession and to give us mercy. We received absolution. We received forgiveness. In a moment, you and I are going to join our voices together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And in that, we will confess for our faith that we believe in the forgiveness of sins. We're going to listen to the words of institution, pray just before Holy Communion as the cup is raised. And we are reminded that this cup is the new covenant in Christ's blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. We'll pray the Lord's Prayer together and we'll ask God to forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now here we say trespasses, trespasses, sin, debt, all the same. But I'm wondering, have you ever really stopped to think about what we are asking of God when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Have you ever really stopped to think about that? I remember in seminary when we were um, studying the Lord's Prayer in Greek class, the professor talking about that to us and I almost fainted. So I'm going to share with you, with you a little bit about what that means. So Martin Luther wrote something called the Large Catechism. Most of us, all of us probably in this room, are familiar with the Small Catechism, which Luther wrote to um, give a guide for families, others in particular, but for families to use to teach their children the tenets of our faith in their homes. But at the time, Luther wasn't just concerned about the lack of understanding and knowledge among the, the families and people in the communities, 
He was also stunned at the ignorance of people who were supposed to be the pastors, who were supposed to be teaching these things to the parents to teach them to the children. So he wrote the large catechism. Excuse me. I have been retrieved. So in the large catechism, um, Luther wrote this, the explanation of the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer, saying that when we pray, forgive our sins, we express our need for God to have mercy on us. You know, kind of like the slave asking um, the Lord for forgiveness on his debt that he can't pay. And God forgives our sins when we ask. In fact, Luther reminds us that God forgives our sins before we ever even pray about it or think about it. Because God has given us the gospel. And the gospel is full of forgiveness. God loves us and forgives us as God has promised every single time. God's forgiveness gives us a joyful and cheerful conscience, Luther writes. And I would say that's true, wouldn't you? When we forgive other people, we feel better. Or when we, when we are forgiven, we feel better. In the parable, Jesus tells us that, um, that even though this slave's debt has been forgiven, the slave himself is not set free. He remains a slave of the, um, of the Lord who is giving his forgiveness. I thought that was really interesting because we, like the slave in today's text, are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. I bet those words sound familiar to you, right? We are captive to sin and we cannot free ourselves. It is God who forgives us. It is God who renews us. It is God who leads us so that we may delight in God's will and walk in God's ways to the glory of God's holy name. It is God who continuously forgives us again and again and again and again and again. Because without God's forgiveness, we're lost. And God loves us far too much to allow that to happen. You see, the challenge with the slave in Jesus' parable is that even though the slave is given this gift of mercy and forgiveness, he is not able to offer it to someone else. Don't we sometimes have the same challenge? How often in our lives have we who are freely forgiven by God in Christ Jesus, struggled to forgive someone else. Luther continues the explanation of the fifth petition in the Lord's Prayer with the second half of that petition, as we forgive those who sin against us. Luther writes that these words place a condition on our forgiveness from God. Ooh, there's a condition. God doesn't always place conditions on things, does God? God just doesn't, but this time he does. So you see, dear church, as we sin against God every day, God continues to forgive all of our sins through grace. And because it is God in Christ Jesus who forgives us without ceasing, we must also be ready to forgive our neighbor who does awful things to us. If we can't forgive our neighbor, then we can't expect that God is going to forgive us. Now, when, with God's help, we do forgive another, then we have the assurance that we are forgiven in heaven, not because of what we do to earn forgiveness, but because Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, Verse 14, if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. We are forgiven because God promises us forgiveness. God gives us the words as we forgive those who sin against us. 
as a reminder of God's own promise to forgive us. This petition of the Lord's Prayer, along with the promises of forgiveness we receive in baptism and at the table of Holy Communion, serve to strengthen and gladden our conscience. Luther writes that, and I quote, above and beyond the other signs, baptism and the Lord's Supper, this petition has been instituted precisely so that we can use and practice it every hour, keeping it with us at all times. Because you see, friends, forgiveness opens up a new future for us, a new way to be in relationship with our neighbor or our family, maybe even ourselves. And sometimes, as we learned last week in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, about going to a person to try to reconcile. And if that doesn't work, go get someone else and go with you. And if that doesn't work, then go to the church. And if it still can't be reconciled, then you have to part ways. Even though we may forgive, there may be circumstances where the relationship just cannot continue. The, 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 the sin has been too great, in which case sometimes we might have to say, I forgive you, but I can't be around you anymore. Sometimes forgiveness is really, really hard. We hold on to the pain of the sin done to us, and we feel that we cannot forgive the other person. Studies have been conducted to determine the impact of forgiveness on our physical and emotional well-being. The study was done in Ireland when um, Ireland was at war, you know, the, the, um, through the 60s, remember that war? The Christians and the, or the Protestants and the Catholics were at war. And a whole generation of children grew up with hating one another and not knowing how to forgive one another. And so there's, there are classes, or I don't know if they continued it, but for a whole generation, classes in school and in nursery school and church and everywhere about how to be kind and how to forgive one another. Because when we can't forgive and we hold on to that pain and anger and hate and resentment and all those other feelings that we feel, it causes physical illness like high blood pressure digestive difficulties, and insomnia, just to name a few. Psychologists have determined that the inability to forgive can affect mental health of an individual, producing things like anxiety and depression and violent tendencies and more. Author Anne Lamott, have any of you read her work? Anne Lamott, she's great. She writes, not forgiving is like drinking rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. So what does it mean to forgive? Hmm? Forgiveness is about letting go of our own need to be right. Our own need to have power. Our own will. It's about letting go of the negative feelings we harbor that hurt other people. Forgiving someone allows us to be in a continuing relationship with someone. We, however, we can't do it on our own. We need God's help. God is with us, in us, around us, God is forgiving us and helping us and loving us not only in the times that it is easy to forgive those who sin against us. God is with us in the times when we struggle to forgive those who sin against us. Complete forgiveness takes time and work. 
And we are expected to do this work again and again and again, 77 times or 70 times seven times as one of the gospels says it. And we are called to do it again until it becomes a way of life, until forgiveness becomes a way of life as opposed to a way of death when we hold grudges. And for that, God forgives us again and again and again. Amen. Let us join our voices together and confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. We pay, pray for the church, bless the missions and ministries of diverse congregations, that they may uplift the good news of salvation in ways that can be understood. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for creation, send rain to lands experiencing drought and healing to rivers clogged with pollution. Enrich the soul, soil for trees and plants, protect the crops needed to feed those who hunger. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for all who govern, encourage those in positions of power to lead with empathy, practice forgiveness, and care for those who struggle. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for our neighbors who face illness of any kind, especially Bob, Jennifer, Nick, Sarah, Carol, Barb, Russ, Casey, Linda, Harlan, Francine, Margaret, Lee, Barbara, Greg, Eleanor, the family of Ellie Martin, Eleanor Sayers, Shirley. For those strained financially, for all living with chronic pain, mental illness, the disease of addiction, or otherwise afraid or in harm's way, protect all who cry out for mercy. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for this congregation. Open our hearts to practice intentional invitation. Help us to forgive each other, practice patience, and choose welcome over judgment. Move us to care for those in our community seeking refuge and safety. Prepare our, our hearts to welcome those who are looking for a church home. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We give thanks for the saints who died in faith, especially Joan Pyle, Brad Thomas, Samantha Nice, John Sherba, Ed Irwin, Mary Ann Martucci, and Betty Schwabel. Show us how to live faithfully, creatively, and lovingly in your church and world like Hildegrin, Abbess of Bingham, whom we commemorated today. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these in the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion, made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Share the sign of peace with your neighbor.
Let us pray. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all may be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. <coughs> The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up our hearts. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to be our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat and live.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in eternal life. Amen. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Jesus Christ, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, just a reminder that today is Lunch Bunch, so anyone who's interested in going out for lunch after worship today will gather in the um, welcome area and decide where we're going to go. So let's go have lunch. And now, a blessing from God our Father. The God of glory, Jesus Christ, name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.